Hey everyone, Chris here with another filler video, and today we're going to address something a number of people have been bugging me about. Why I'm primarily using an old, standard build of DOSBox instead of the more up-to-date and advanced DOSBox X. Well, for those unaware, DOSBox is open source, so anyone with any level of skill is free to download and modify it to their own purposes. Now, given that the main 0.74 build of DOSBox is very old by this point, originally coming out in the latter half of 2012, with most of the development tied up in SBN builds since, it's no surprise that some people took it upon the themselves to make their own builds, which addressed its various shortcomings. Well, as an example, the DOSBox SVN DOM build is another one that's frequently suggested to me. However, as far as I can tell, that one hasn't been updated since early 2015. DOSBox X is a project being maintained by one Jonathan Campbell, also known across the internet as the Great Code Holio, and is based on the original 0.74 build of DOSBox, thus has grown on its own independently of the ongoing work on DOSBox itself through the SVN builds, though occasionally some of the stuff added to the SVN builds also gets ported into DOSBox X. The general goal of the DOSBox X project seems to be geared more towards just getting things working and improving both compatibility and accuracy, rather than adding new features. Which isn't to say there aren't any new features over the original DOSBox, just that there's definitely a heavy emphasis on improving the emulation itself. In fact, the DOSBox X website has some extensive comparison tables you can look through to see how it performs compared to the DOSBox SVN builds, but said tables aren't really a good way to really analyze which is better for the casual user, especially since most of them relate to demo scene stuff, where hardware accuracy is extremely important. So. We're going to do some side-by-side -side comparisons. I've already been playing some games in the background here, but in all circumstances, and unless otherwise indicated on screen, you'll be hearing the audio from DOSBox X on the right side, with DOSBox 0.74-3 on the left side. I should also point out, the recent Dash versions of DOSBox are extremely minor updates to address security concerns, and have been coming out to prep everyone for the release of 0.75, which I'm told by the devs isn't too far off. So once 0.75 is out, we're going to run these comparisons again in a second video. But for now, it's DOSBox 0.74-3 versus DOSBox X 0.82.20 with the final goal being to determine if DOSBox X is a suitable replacement for 0.74, whether it's good to have alongside 0.74 for when 0.74 isn't good enough, or if DOSBox X is just a complete waste of time. Let's begin. One of the first things I wanted to test was performance, and one of the simplest games to do a performance test with is Descent 2, as it has the ability to show a frame rate counter. And yeah, right off the bat, it seems the accuracy of X's emulation is coming at the price of a huge performance hit. Now granted, you normally wouldn't run Descent 2 in max cycles because of minor timing issues which can affect the gameplay, but for sake of a performance test, it works well enough. Well, this also gave me a chance to test the joystick support. Now, this isn't something you'll see watching the gameplay, but the joystick support in X is much more flexible and even supports joystick axes beyond the first four, yet surprisingly has some unusual bugs. Uh, for instance, in the CH flight stick mode, two of the axes weren't working at all, and the two which were pretended to be the two which weren't. And I switched from CH support to 4-axis support while leaving Descent 2 in CH mode, and then everything worked fine, so I have no idea what was up with that. I do also like that X has customizable dead zones, though the default dead zones of 25% are a bit on the high side and unnecessary if you have a mid or high quality joystick or gamepad. I wanted to test out Catacomb Abyss for a couple reasons. And the first was to see if the floor glitching present in 0.74 was still present in X, though X is handling this aspect perfectly fine. The other thing is that Catacomb Abyss is one of the very, very few games out there which actually uses the CRT overscan area to convey information, specifically flashing red any time a player takes a hit. Unfortunately, emulation of this feature is still very rudimentary in DOSBox X, as it only works with surface rendering, which doesn't perform nearly as well as OpenGL or Direct3D rendering in either version of DOSBox. It's just more compatible than OpenGL, which is why it's a default rendering mode. And it's also not being cleared properly when set back to a zero color, as it just stays permanently lit red here instead of simply flashing for an instant. So this feature of the emulation isn't quite ready for prime time, but at least we know it's in the works. <laughs> 
The reason I let this play out a little is because the most notable thing about emulating the original Duke Nukem is that 0.74 doesn't get the sound effects right. Like games which do unusual timings with the PC speaker can end up sounding wrong at 0.74, but this was addressed fairly early on in X's lifespan. So now, have a listen to that exact same section again, but from X's audio. <laughs> Yeah, definitely sounds very different. Though this kind of makes me wonder how else the PC speaker might sound different. No doubt about it, that's deep in the sand trap. So, real sound was a thing Access Software did, producing digitized sound over the PC speaker. Now, it sounded grainy on real hardware, but sounds very clean under DOSBox 0.74. Kinda too clean, really. Now, interestingly enough, if you take a listen as to how it sounds on DOSBox X side of things... From my vantage point, it looks safely in the fairway. Yeah, it's nearly identical, so real sound still works as expected, just without real hardware screwing up the fidelity. So, I was going to showcase DOSBox X being able to launch Thexter into its MCGA mode, as 0.74 doesn't have a dedicated MCGA mode, as VGA is pretty much 100% backwards compatible with MCGA. But trying to boot Thexter with DOSBox X configured for MCGA support led to this. Apparently, it was still trying to run the EGA mode, despite the machine setting. So, just for a point of reference, this is what it's supposed to happen. Now, you can trick Thexter into running its MCGA executable data by swapping the file names for its main EG and main PS files, which would work in any version of DOSBox. But the whole reason for DOSBox X having a dedicated MCGA mode is for games which are specifically trying to detect the presence of an MCGA chipset for an old PS2 computer. Now, Thexter's just incredibly determined to be absolutely 100% certain it's running on a real PS2, and just assumes EGA if any of its numerous checks fail. As for the MCGA mode itself, you'll notice it does look a little bit different than the TANI mode seen in 0.74 right now. Well, the MCGA mode is altering the palette slightly, but is otherwise still using the same graphical data as the TANI mode. Now with any luck, future versions of X will be able to convince this thing it's running on a PS2 system, as the author is very aware of Thexter's temperamental auto-detection, and has taken many steps towards trying to get it working. King's Quest is an example of a game which successfully triggers 0.74's composite CGA mode, so it's a good way to compare 0.74's composite rendering to that of X's. Now, the funny thing here is that X maintains a normal computer monitor aspect ratio compared to 0.74 going into an aspect ratio more akin to what you'd get on an old television. Plus the colors are a bit more saturated in DOSBox X compared to 0.74. But then, and that's one of the crazy things about supporting composite output, is that there's no standardization when it comes to color, just approximations. So everyone's got different ideas as to what's normal given whatever brands of TVs they grew up with. To that end, both versions of DOSBox really need to have adjustments present for composite support, as plenty of 80s DOS games do support composite output, as it was just a simple way to squeeze 16 color graphics out of a CGA card. Even though it meant fuzzy text and having to suffice with only 160 pixels of horizontal resolution without the colors bleeding together too badly. 0.74 also has no way to manually trigger composite output, so either it has to detect that a game intends to utilize this, which doesn't always work, or additional software needs to be loaded in within DOSBox to manually trigger this. Now, typically, you'd play this game using a source port nowadays, especially given that DOSBox 0.74 doesn't really handle it all that well, and yeah, neither does X. The flickering in 0.74 is pretty bad, as is screen tearing from what I can only assume is some kind of vertical sync conflict, as the game does vSync on real hardware. In DOSBox X, the tearing isn't present, but the flickering is to a lesser extent, and the frame rate stutters more. So either way you slice it, running this game in DOSBox isn't the way to go anymore. When I originally tried to get this working in DOSBox 0.74, it ran incredibly slow. 
And while you could just bump the cycles counts way up, it actually didn't help because it would just end up missing all your keystrokes anyways. As you can see on X's side though, it's running at the right speed there, given the exact same configuration settings between the two. Not only in the exact same settings which are shared between 0.74 and X. Now, that said, there is a utility you could grab which runs the TSR to patch the game on the fly to resolve this timing issue, but I found it led to other minor issues, notably with sound. That's why I recommended using an older version of DOSBox over the patch. But with DOSBox X, the patch is completely unnecessary. Unfortunately, this is an example of one of the comparisons I had planned, which didn't amount to anything. Line Wars 2 has a special 800x600 256 color mode accessible with S3 and ATI chipsets. Now, DOSBox doesn't support the ATI stuff, but does support the S3 stuff. However, the specific mode Line Wars 2 attempts to set is 800x600 at 256 colors at 75 hertz whereas most SVGA modes in DOS run at between 50 and 70 Hz. Now, despite this problem being known since 0.73, it was never fixed for 0.74 and isn't fixed in DOSBox X either, at least at present. Again, the author of X is constantly adding and adjusting things, so after this video goes live, don't be surprised if Line Wars 2's 800x600 mode is suddenly working in the next or thereafter version of DOSBox X. Although in the process, I learned Line Wars 2 is being ported to Unity by its original author with updated graphics and VR support. So that's a thing that's happening. This relatively obscure 2D shooter performs some very weird transitions when you die, which end up completely altering the display resolution every frame to produce its effects. Now, because of the way DOSBox 0.74 works, this results in bizarre window handling behavior and only looks even remotely normal when running full screen. In DOSBox X, however, these transitions are even more broken, with some just not even working at all and rapidly zooming through as if the transition never happened. Now that said though, this was another game sensitive to PC speaker timing, so the audio of firing your shots sounded very different in DOSBox X, likely more accurate. So you can either go with 0.74 with for the transitions which work right, or X for more accurate pew pews. Either way, I don't ever expect this game to have run perfectly emulated because of that bizarre behavior, but you never know. Morph's World is interesting for being a DOS game which supports numerous non-VESA compliant SVGA modes, so I wanted to see if DOSBox X would support any modes DOSBox 0.74 would not. And no luck. Both versions of DOSBox produce pretty much the same results, trying out all the various SVGA modes using different machine settings. The most important thing of note with this is that the 1024 by 768 256 color S3 modes do not work in either version of DOSBox when set to an S3 machine setting. Otherwise, the results are about as expected, with the Sang Labs ET3000 and ET4000 modes all working right, along with the Paradise modes. Although also of note is that the 800 by 616 color mode for AHEAD cards works with most of the SVGA capable machine settings, suggesting that particular mode in this game may actually be a VESA compliant mode. I also noted that IBM 8514 support was still missing too. Now the IBM 8514 was an early 2D graphics accelerator card which helped lead into the ATI's Mach 8 and Mach 32 chipsets, none of which is presently supported by DOSBox or DOSBox X, despite being supported by mm, a fair number of DOS applications and games, and not a huge amount of software by any stretch, but enough that it'd be nice to see support for these added someday. One of the problems I ran into with this game and DOSBox 0.74 was that it would hang when trying to export a table into an executable file. Now, using an earlier version of DOSBox circumvented this problem. Thankfully, DOSBox X seems to have this problem dealt with too, so exporting to an EXE in X works perfectly fine. Other than that, PCS stuff works pretty much exactly as expected in both versions of DOSBox. This was another performance test to see how well the game was playing, as well as to test if the game's intentional reconfiguration of the standard VGA mode would be detected and processed properly to make for a standard aspect ratio instead of the stretched ratio 320x200 normally has on a CRT monitor. And both DOSBox 0.74 and DOSBox X pretty much performed correctly and exactly the same. It felt like there might have been more frame rate hiccups on X instead of 0.74, but that was more likely just Windows 10 being stupid, as ever since they introduced game mode a while back, I've been having all sorts of frame rate issues running certain games and applications in a window or borderless full screen, 
which is what I have to do for capturing footage. I did test it in a proper exclusive full screen mode and had no issues with stuttering frame rates. I did also notice though that DOSBox X doesn't do a good job of keeping unused space clear, leading to all kinds of flickering when video modes changed mid-game, at least when running with OpenGL rendering. Now, DOSBox X actually does include a direct 3D rendering mode, which works better on the Windows side of things than the OpenGL mode. And that's not to be confused with the original direct draw mode DOSBox 0.74 has, which does not work well at all on Windows 8 or 10. But I had no idea it was there because the config files didn't list it properly. You can turn on Direct 3D support from DOSBox X's menus, or simply set the output line in the config files to Direct 3D. This is one of the earliest games I ever covered on Ancient DOS games, and one of the first times I ran into an emulation issue I, that I couldn't figure a way around, as serve and volley sound effects for the ball are extremely brief pops from the PC speaker. The DOSBox 0.74 simply isn't producing them properly, but because PC speaker sound is handled differently in DOSBox X, and can account for timing intervals smaller than a single millisecond, these sounds are rendered perfectly fine in X. Other than that, the game plays exactly as expected, as it really doesn't do anything too complicated. The last game I wanted to check out was something a bit more modern, which came out right around the turn of the century, that game being Lacewing. Now, this is a game which works perfectly fine in DOSBox 0.74, so all I wanted to do is confirm that it still worked perfectly fine in DOSBox X, seeing that it is using the cross-platform Allegro game programming libraries to do its thing. But sure enough, they do indeed both play perfectly fine. So, what's the final verdict? Is DOSBox X a suitable replacement for DOSBox 0.74? Is it good to have alongside a 0.74 install for the cases where it makes the most sense to use it? Or is it just not worth the effort? Well, I think we've pretty firmly established that in cases where the emulation fails to some degree in 0.74, X has a decent chance of solving the issue and working right, so that final option there isn't even in play. DOSBox X clearly has some merit, but is it good enough to replace using DOSBox 0.74 entirely? Well, no. The raw performance of 0.74 is multiple times stronger, so for later DOS games which demand lots of power and don't do a whole lot of weird tricks that need to be accounted for, 0.74 is still the better way to go. At least until you run into 3D accelerated stuff, which 0.74 can't handle at all. But there's not a lot of those. But besides, there's one last thing we haven't addressed yet, and that's actually configuring DOSBox X. On screen right now is a listing of all the config settings you'd find in a DOSBox 0.74 config file. Well, it's a lot, yes, but much of it is pretty straightforward. Now compare that to a DOSBox X config file. <laughs> Yeah, the quantity of adjustable options to account for all the little nuances DOSBox X is designed to overcome is extreme, and well beyond what's necessary to modify for most games. So yeah, DOSBox X is definitely good to have alongside a standard DOSBox build for all the cases where the more accurate and customizable emulation factors will result in actually getting something to work right or at all, whereas 0.74 is still the better choice for later DOS games which demand tons of power to run at peak performance. I suspect what's going to happen going forwards is I'll probably use DOSBox X as my default for 80s games and some early 90s games, while continuing to use 0.74 for everything following at least until 0.75 comes out. Then we can run all these tests one more time and see where it stands. Anywho, that's all for this filler video. Next episode of Ancient DOS Games, episode 259, will be on Saturday, September 7th. And I've got a very intriguing DOS game lined up, as it's one that was never actually meant to see the light of day. That's right, a game that was intentionally designed to be internal to a company and not publicly distributed. Now, I didn't obtain this illegally or anything. It did actually see a public freeware release a couple years after it was made. But few people found it, few people talked about it, and finding copies nowadays is extremely hard. So make sure you stay tuned for this one because I don't think very many people know about this game at all. Thanks for watching, everyone, and extra special thanks to those of you supporting me on Patreon. Here's just a small set of you guys. Sequence overridden.